All right. Well, thanks for joining us for our conversation with uh, Tony Woodleaf, longtime friend of mine and more important, executive vice president of the State Policy Network, uh, which will let him describe, I guess, it's a network of conservative state think tanks, uh, right. <clears throat> author of the new encounter book uh, called I Have a Prop, I Citizen, uh, a blueprint for reclaiming American self-governance. Yeah. Uh, before his uh, role at SPN, or in a previous chapter of his life anyway, there might have been another chapter in there. I don't know, Tony, you can tell us. Uh, <laughs> Tony was uh, <clears throat> played several roles in the, in the Koch family of companies and uh, uh, one of the, the foundations in uh, the larger Koch family of entities. Uh, <laughs> so, Tony, first, let's just talk about you. Uh, where's home? Where you uh, I'm in... Uh, I'm in Oak Ridge, North Carolina. Thanks for having me, by the way, Mike. Good to see your face. It's been a while. We've all been in lockdown. Um, but yeah, middle part of North Carolina. Uh, is that where you were born? That's where you, that, you are. You're a Carolinian? North Carolina. That's right. I'm, I live about uh, 20 miles from the hospital where I was born in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And I happen to know you went to the University of Michigan at some point in your life to get a PhD in political science. That's correct. I, I minored in winter. Um, it was extensive study in winter, which lasts about 11 months. <laughs> did you yeah. go snowshoes or how did you handle it? Did you, what was in them? The L.L. Bean like uh, boot things, you know? <laughs> well, I had to improvise because I brought a North Carolina coat to the party <laughs> and that was not getting it done. And there were days when I was literally, and I use that, that word intentionally, literally afraid to go outside for fear of what the cold might do to me. Um, so I, I missed a few classes, to be honest, until I figured out what to wear. <laughs> oh, I was going to ask what your PhD thesis was on, but I guess, <laughs> I guess winter. But uh, what was it on? Uh, it, uh, I studied a phenomenon called path dependence. And in a nutshell, uh, it just kind of looks at how bad decisions that people, that groups make with good intentions kind of get locked in. So for the great example, of course, is rent control in New York City. Once they did that, they destroyed the housing stock. They created this kind of litigious environment and good luck getting rid of it now. So, in, 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 or you could put it this way. I studied why smart people do dumb things in groups. You know, we have talked about this before now that you mention it. We That's need right. to do a show on philanthropic path dependence because it might exist. Oh, I'm sure it does. Yeah. yeah. We usually think of it... The, Somebody wrote the book, Dem something sclerosis, Dem demos sclerosis. And I thought, well, there's clearly philanthrosclerosis where oh, yeah. you can't get something out of the arteries once it's in there, you know. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, and you have to be careful in the philanthropic realm that you don't create a kind of a dependency. It's the same with foreign aid. I mean, very good intentions, but people align themselves to what it takes to keep getting the money. Yeah. And so it's a, you know, I've been in the philanthropic seat and there's a certain care. There's a respect for what people are doing. Um, they're not making a lot of money in that realm, in some cases because they can't make money anywhere else, but often because they care about the mission. But uh, you have to take care or you can pervert their mission. So perhaps relatedly, uh, what did you do for Coke? In your roles there, what uh, did you do? Uh, well, I came in uh, to the company first after meeting with Charles and we talked about his management philosophy, market-based management. Of course, I've been studying how organizations behave and he thought I might be able to help them sort through uh, what is market-based management in plain English and how do they impart that to the company and so on. So I was a management consultant inside Coke Industries for a while. And then I went over to uh, the Charles Koch Foundation and my job there was to help them make um, you know, decisions about where to invest their funds, mostly in education, higher ed projects. Uh, and how long have you been at SPN then and, and, and what do you do there? That's a great question. People often ask me that, and I try to skirt the subject, but I, I've been uh, at SPN since 2013, uh, and my, my role primarily is, you know, you, you kind of play a utility infielder in many ways, you know, raise money one day, try to solve a problem another, but my primary job is coaching the heads of our various programs from fundraising to operations to all the, the work we do with think tanks, uh, and then work with my boss, Tracy Sharp, our president, to you know, drive strategy. How are we going to grow? What what are we trying to get done? Those kinds of things. So, I citizen. Uh, w well, when did you start to write it, and and why? What's 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 wrong? Why does America need this book? 
Oh, there's so many reasons. I'm so glad you asked. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I didn't see that question coming. Um, <laughs> well, I, I started last fall, so the fall of um, 2020. It was uh, uh, I, I worked a lot of hours to get it done and out this year. And um, the reason I wrote it is I had this growing frustration at the narrative that, that is predominant in this country on the left and the right. Um, the, and the narrative is that the country's on the verge of civil war, that you've got red America and blue America, or as David French says, there are enclaves of you know, red America and blue America, and they hate each other. And the more I thought about it, I thought, what? Well, that doesn't sound like anybody I know in the real world. I mean, it sounds like people in DC, but it doesn't sound like real Americans who live in an actual state instead of a district. So I decided to look into public opinion which had not been my specialty at the University of Michigan, even though that is the specialty at the University of Michigan. And what I found was that most Americans are not very ideological. They're not highly invested in politics. They're center right, apologies to my more liberal friends, but most Americans are center right. They do want some restrictions on abortion. They they don't want their taxes too high. They do like the military and the police, Um, but they're not ideological uh, wing nuts. And they really want more than anything else for government to work and for people to get along. And what's fascinating is that the political class, the campaign consultants, donors, activists, the people who are highly invested in winning, those folks are the ones who are hard red and blue and who hate each other. And they're the ones who are driving that narrative and telling us, regular people, that we're the problem in America, which then, to wrap it all up, justifies their ongoing abuse of power, their continual uh, removal of decisions from the democratic realm and from states and communities and putting it in DC largely in the hands of judges and federal agencies. So, so that's what I argue when I citizens is the real war in America is not between Democrats and Republicans or liberals and conservatives. It's between regular people and the political class that largely subsists in DC. Does that class include philanthropy? Or I'll, uh, I, I, let me rephrase the question, um, which I'm trying. I anticipated your answer mid question. Uh-huh. That include big establishment philanthropy. Uh, I, I I think it depends. Yeah. Uh, you know, there a lot of big establishment philanthropy is focused on health, right? A genuine research and so on. So yeah, we have to take all that off the table. And so if we want to narrow it down to big established philanthropy and the sort of civil sphere, funding think tanks, you know, oh, funding groups great. like State Policy Network and. Uh, you know, groups on the left, I think it depends. Um, and, and we can get into that. I think, uh, if, for example, you know, but the folks at American Conservative the magazine have written quite a bit about the Ford Foundation and, and investigating, arguing that some of what Ford now does is, you know, finance what amounts to, maybe they don't intend it, I'm sure that I would hope they wouldn't intend it, but which culminates in violence in communities, you know, rioting and attacks on the police and, and, you know, citizens who don't vote the right way. So there are allegations like that, that, you know, I'm not an expert in it, but I I think there's some credibility there. So it really comes back to what are you investing in and and what's your underlying purpose? If your purpose is to subvert the will of people in their communities because you don't like how they vote or you don't like their opinions on issues like abortion or policing, well, that to me, it's not necessarily criminal, probably isn't criminal, but it's certainly uncivil and, and a violation, transgression on the ethos of the Constitution. So then let's just finish with this, we'll clear the table of this question. You worked at, uh, well, you work at SPN and worked with Coke. Mm-hmm. Don't those organizations, didn't you essentially contribute to what one might think is polarization and an unhealthy uh, attitude towards each other as American citizens? Yeah, well, I, you know, I've pondered that a lot. I think there are times when I was certainly an ideologue who um, made the error, made the mistake of assuming the worst kinds of intentions among people who disagree with me. I've, I've been that jerky guy at times. Um, one thing I try to stress in my book because uh, there's so much focus on polarization in the country, you know, the idea that there's an ideological spectrum and you've got people clustered at one end or the other, at the poles. And a point I try to make in my book is that polarization by itself is not bad. I mean, and and in fact, a lack of polarization can be very unhealthy for a polity. Uh, You know, uh, Fidel Castro's cabinet 
was not very polarized, right? They're the Marxists and the Marxists and maybe some Leninists, and that's it. Uh, the editorial board of Teen Vogue is not very polarized. And, and I wouldn't want to take direction from either of those institutions. So I think the problem is that when polarization is accompanied by a vilification, a, a sort of uh, ideological malleability, where, where your ide ideology really becomes being against. You know, it's, a, it's a, the worst kind of Protestantism, where you're just protesting, you're against the other side, no matter what. And that's what poisons uh, politics. Do you read uh, Teen Vogue? Uh, not anymore. Not since they, they've really just veered too far to the left for me. And I um, decided yeah. no more. I've had it. All right. Well, with that self-indictment uh, of your, <laughs> your own career and uh, your, your, your readership, let's finish up with uh, part one there. How about and uh, get to part two in a bit here. All right.